DraftKings Sportsbook is officially live in Ohio. New customers, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code DEFEND to get $200 in bonus bets instantly when you place a $5 bet on anything. That's code DEFEND, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER, 21 and over in fiscally present Ohio. Valid one offer per first-time depositors who have not already redeemed $200 in free bets via pre-launch offer. Minimum $5 deposit and wager. $200 issued as bonus bets. Eligibility restrictions apply. See dnkg.co slash oh for terms. Another BritFlix.com podcast. My name's Stuart Wright, and today's guest is Thomas Wright. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, mate. Thank you for having me. That's my pleasure, my pleasure. Now, we've come to talk about your movie, The Stranger, starring Joel Edgerton and Britain's Sam Harris. Um, before we get into it, do you want to get a brief synopsis as to what The Stranger is about? Yeah, look, The the Stranger is basically a fictionalised retelling of an undercover police operation that was responsible for couching a person responsible for one of the worst crimes, uh, well, certainly one of the largest uh, crime investigations in Australia's history, which was the, um, the death of a young boy. Um, and, um, and the film basically, um, that's a very unsophisticated way of talking about quite a complex film, but... Um, yeah, it's basically uh, catching a person who's responsible for the for the you know one of the worst kind of crimes imaginable. Yeah, and it was it's ba- it's it's based on a book by um, Kate Kiriakou. I'm glad you said yeah. the surname. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. So no, look, it was a basically look. It, Kate's book is is a work a true crime investigative piece of journalism. Um, mostly about the police operation in mm. this particular case, but also about all sorts of stuff to do with the victim and their family and the the unimaginable pain that they went through over years and years and years of um, trying to resolve this case, as well as all the other suspects. It's a very far-reaching work of sort of investigative um, crime journalism and the film has a much closer focus solely on people who never met that family okay. and never met that victim. Um and didn't didn't know them, but who sort of dedicated years of their life and 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 ultimately really their sort of their mental and physical health yeah. to resolving the case for those strangers. Yeah. So there's no representation of the victim. Um, there's no violence in the film. There's no representation of the victim's family. It's told um, entirely about um, this undercover operation, which is quite a unique construct, which involves. Um, convincing the the suspect that they're a part of a large criminal organisation in order to um, confront them with insight that they may have committed this crime from police sources and, and elicit a confession, mm. um, which then, you know, relies on that person leading you to to evidence because obviously you're giving them every incentive to um, to confess. I mean, give it. Give I'm it. actually not sure if, he, if that technique is actually legal in Britain. Actually, I know it's not legal in America, but it is here, and it was founded in um, in Australia, and it was founded in Canada. Yeah, I was going to say I'd, I'd read about how it had been. It was it's it, 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 notable in Canada, but I hadn't read anything about using the technique because I guess I guess there's in. I mean, I'm no legal expert, but there's in America. I imagine this is what entrapment is called: the idea of leading someone into a Look, I mean, I think it has to do with certain incentives that are put out there, and you know, the legal parameters of this of this technique are such that the organisation can't be seen to be involved in any violence um, because the person making the fes- confession can't do that within the context of feeling that they could be that they could be harmed if yeah, they yeah. didn't confess. They own the only thing it can hang on is them confessing because it's to their advantage. Mm. To, to progress in this organisation, so yeah, in this case, there are in this particular case, there were up to fifty undercover operatives working to um, catch this one um, individual. The Guardian described it as a sophisticated crime drama, which I thought was a a, a really a really simple way of describing what you've got. But also, it's it's a fairly elaborate film. I always describe it as being on one hand entirely structural and on the other hand entirely psychological and I felt like with these sorts of films I'd never seen something that took me deep enough inside a person's head 
Um, because this undercover operation involved basically one central undercover operative having to befriend and really become the closest person to the person responsible for this kind of unnameable act of violence. Mm. Um, and and it was a very lengthy operation, about five months of full-time undercover work side by side with that person, spending every day in a car with them, um, spending all your time with this person. Um, and I was interested in um, where does that take you to be in such proximity to darkness? Because, you know, for all of us, um, we all move from the world of childhood into the adult world, and that means confronting the darkness in the world and a darkness that most of us will never really, really understand. And even the people responsible for some of that darkness will never really fully understand it. But um, here you have a very concentrated, yeah, a very concentrated idea of that. Well, in, in that in that concentration on him, you then play with, almost play with, that's a, a, it's in the wrong word, um, you use sort of non-linear techniques in, in a sort of telling the story with the police investigation that's going on alongside the undercover or or was happening. Um, yeah, the idea is, you know, the film's told all around these kind of dualities, so the inside of a person and the outside of a person, the lie that they tell, the truth of what's really happened, and structurally on one hand you have this mass, massive police investigation, a evidence-based detective-led investigation, um, which has led to this undercover operation mm. and the film the film tells that as two um, parallel narratives, which are revealed to be at the three quarter point of the film parallel timelines, yeah, yeah, where yeah. the detective work has actually led to the undercover operation, which has led to with all using all that information gathered by the detectives, has led to a strong enough psychological understanding of this person that 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 they've led him to this day when they're going to go for the um, for the confession. What, so yeah. What for you are the storytelling challenges of trying to trying to compete have those parallels timelines compete with each other? Well, look that 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 was something that look the way I wrote this film was that I spent about six months researching full time, seven days a week, about ten hours a day. Gee, whiz. Um, mostly I would occasionally take a Sunday off, but I had a you know between the legal side of things, um, the police side of things, the psychological aspects, the logistic aspects. Um, the fact that it's basically about the making of a film, like the police are literally writing scenarios and crafting things on a day-to-day basis, casting undercover operatives, looking at locations, writing scripts to take this guy up through the rungs of this criminal organisation, mm. um, as well as the actual detective investigation and the personal history of this individual. Um, and again, this is all fictionalised in the film. Mm. Um, all names and details have been changed and we were, and I was in the, the act of creating characters here but i felt that without getting a full understanding of the reality I, I had no right to put pen to paper in this instance and so i wrote and i basically built the film on the wall in kind of card form okay. in my um in the in the room where i wrote it mm. um because something like this is it's essentially a five act structure with about 50 scenes per act so it's a 250 scene oh. film um so i really needed to build it first and then, um, and then when I sat down to write it, I wrote it in six days. And then I uh, got hospitalised. Oh my goodness! Um, the next day, yeah, I got hospitalised with pneumonia. My whole body shut down. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't walk. I um, was just—it's the most sick I've ever been in my life. And I don't think I'd realised what a toll the six months of reading this material um, and dealing with this. Um, case had kind of um, had on me and My I words. mean it was a small window into um, what it would actually be to deal with this stuff on a day-to-day basis yeah. and work on these cases in a day-to-day basis and you know it was a very research heavy process of writing this and we certainly you know we'll never be able to talk about how this film was really researched who we spoke to or how we talked with them or um what information was there, but I, I can say that people who do this sort of work and have been involved in these sorts of cases, um, you know, um, consulted and have seen the film and can attest to how authentic it is. And actually we've been, you know, getting, you know, hearing from people who work in these fields saying um, that they, they actually haven't seen a, a, a representation of their work that's actually even though it's um, highly psychological in the film, very accurate in the detail of um, the actual work that they do. 
your film definitely takes you into the heart of something that, you know, from a British, as a British viewer watching it, something I was, I mean, I wasn't yeah. familiar with the, the what, what, where the, where the, the idea came from, the original case that's obviously famous and notorious in Australia. Plus the technique itself was completely alien. So uh, Yeah, that's right. Well, and I needed to assume that it was for everybody, that everybody came into this film as blank slates. Yeah. And it needed to and it needed to explain all of this to them without resorting to um a cheap exposition. Mm. Um and just having a character turn up and say what's going on, you needed to experience it. You needed to be put in the shoes of what it is to be a target of an operation like this, because otherwise I don't think you can appreciate just how sophisticated it is and just mm. how convincing it is. It's like building a dream around a person, um, you know, but I think it's been interesting because we didn't know how much interest in this film would hang on um, knowledge of the particular case and that sort of thing. And obviously we've just seen in the last few days, it's it's been at, since its launch, it's been in, at number four and number three on Netflix worldwide. So the third most watched English language film on um, Netflix worldwide for the last couple of weeks. Right. Um, and it really is a, a, a small Australian film that was made, um, you know, not not without resources but relative to what we were trying to achieve. Mm. Um, it was uh, such a tough film to make, a really tough film to make. Um, but I think it speaks to people's interest in in um, Joel and in Sean Harris and in what it is to see transformative performances too because that's what I love in cinema. I want to see things that take you into places that you couldn't otherwise go um, and that um, and that show you people under under extraordinary circumstances um, behaving in ways that are difficult to um, predict, you know. Great, great character work. Yeah. I mean, I mean, great character work indeed. I mean, Joel, jo, what was what's interesting on this on the second watch for me was because I could I could free myself from trying to need to work out what's going on. I could watch what is happening mm-hmm. literally, and mm. you you see a lot of what Joel Edgerton has to do is is almost to do nothing in a way. He needs to contain so much. So what was the conversation like between you and Joel about sort of, because that's almost like counterintuitive. It's like it, it it doesn't feel like that's heightened, but actually it's so heightened in the context of the story. Yeah, because, because you're realising more and more as you watch the film. And I think I really was very conscious of making a film that I wanted people to be able to go back and watch a second and third time mm. and for it to th- feel almost three-dimensional, that you could turn it in the light and see a different aspect of it. And um, it is very different on a second watch. And I've had a, a lot of people... Um, you know, say that on a second watch, it's a completely, completely different experience. But, um, you know, Joel prepared for almost um, two years for this film. He was involved in a lot of that research with me. I mean, he had access to it. Mm. Um, and Sean prepared for over a year um, to play this part. And I, I just watched it shift them both on a really kind of atomic molecular level. They were just were not the people that they were when they began it. And it was a very tense, very difficult shoot because of that, because the whole film is about holding on to these lies and holding on to these false selves like a performance of yourself. And um, I think, you know, that it was, uh, yeah, it was very, very intense. And Joel prepared for a year, even with the relationship with his son, which is my son, played by my son in real life, Cormax, my little boy, Um so they had a year of talking to each other and sort of building that relationship and building that connection. Um, um, yeah. I mean, can you can you give any specific examples of scenes where Joel choices Joel took in terms of when the camera's rolling? Yet you were you were like you couldn't have hoped for that kind of um, translation of well, your words you prepare, on the page. Well, you prepare and prepare and prepare and then often um you know you mentioned just before we started talking about this about kubrick and you know kubrick's someone who's notorious for the level of control he exerted over his films but he's also someone that if you read closely what he said was also all about giving over to the moment that you come to shoot and being changed by the material and and um and tr- and finding something different on the day. Now it's very different when you're Stanley Kubrick with a with a year to shoot a film yeah. when you're us and you've got 250 scenes to shoot in seven and a half weeks. <laughs> I mean the maths is the maths is not good. It was no. it was a really really um, tough 
film logistically, but um, there were definitely certain scenes. I mean, there's a scene toward the end of the film where Joel is, um, you know, really very emotional, um, which we were shooting toward the very end of the shoot as well. And during the process of making this film, Joel found out he was going to be a father. Oh, wow. And, um, and um, you know, that had a huge emotional effect on him, um, dealing with this material and dealing with my son um, so much as well. And when we got to that scene, to shoot that scene, um, I walked up to him and it was just the two of us and I'd, I'd moved the crew away as we were relocating um, within a small area. And I said, um, I don't know what we're going to do here. Um, and uh, the minute I said that, he he just broke down crying. Um, and I said, oh, wow. um, okay, just hold here. And I said, get the camera over here right now. I don't need any equipment. I need you to bring the camera over here, clear everybody out. And we brought the, brought the camera over and, and we just shot that moment, which had been written completely differently. And I, I won't tell you what it was or what was intended there or anything like that, but it was a very simple, really direct moment of, you know, catharsis for him. And, yeah. and, and, and not, not catharsis, it was being genuinely overwhelmed that he'd had to hold on to all of this bodily, like you said, so much of this film with Joel is about holding that tension in. Yeah. And, you know, as you watch the film, and maybe when you watch the film a second time, you realise Mark's not a very sophisticated character. And remembering that that's not even his real name. Mm. We never learn the name of our central character in this film. No, I, t- I tell but you, what, I tell you what, Thomas, the second time round, you realise how powerless Mark is more so than when you first yeah, watch right. it. Yeah, that's right. And he only has about two sets of clothes that he wears and he alternates them. It's like he's an incomplete character and so is Henry. So is Sean Harris's yeah. character. Both are um, both are, are completely, you know, hidden. And, uh, yeah, so that was certainly a moment like that. But, there, you know, there were many moments like that. When you're dealing with actors that are that strong, a, a last-minute, you know, provocation or a question or even an insistence or even a tension that forms between you can bring mm. something new to the scene that you you never could have um, expected. And, you know, those performances are being commented on uniformly everywhere around the, around the world. And, um, you know, I think when it comes to the supporting cast, whether it's Cormac, my son, who was eight when we shot the film, Steve Mazarkas, who plays Paul at the beginning, Jada Alberts, who plays the lead um, detective, or Alan Dukes, who plays John, mm. who's sort of set up as the head of the organisation, um, who who has to, um, who has to, you know, evoke the actual confession itself. Um, yeah, I think it was. Um, there's phenomenal work in there from all of them. Um, I, I, again, I'm ta- this is me talking from the second viewing as opposed to the first. I mean, it was a scene that struck mm. me in the first one, but then second time round, I could. Because it's a mo- it's one of the, one of the few moments of sort of light in the film, and obviously we're talking about two very dark characters dealing with what they're having to deal with from their points of view. But the moment when Henry plays Mark the music is mm-hmm. is I mean, seeing it this time round, you're like it was almost like that was without saying it that was like I trust you was like was this moment, and it was just about playing a song. What's wonderful about that is people interpret that scene in so many different ways. Uh, and and as and as a director, that's what you're trying to. Uh, that's at least what my interest is. Someone the other day was talking about the scene where they go into the Return Servicemen's League um, RSLs. We have them around the country where they they they, it, they ask for a moment of silence and they say a prayer for the fallen. They shall not grow old yeah. as we who are left grow old. Um, and that says that scene is another scene that's interpreted completely differently by by everyone um and and you know i'm i'm inviting that interpretation i'm Hmm. saying there are multiple ways to look at this multiple ways to to work out what's going on here i mean people have talked about also even as a moment as simple as when henry reaches over and takes a piece of fluff off mark's Hmm. shirt um I, i i heard someone the other day say was he checking for a microphone um you know was he was he checking for a recording device? Um, <laughs> you know, but um, but it can also be read as someone whose understanding of social cues and normal conventions and a relationship to his own impulses is very different to the rest of us. Um, 
So yeah, it's a highly unusual um, relationship. I mean, in a, in a way, I mean, this might sound highfalutin, but in a way, it's almost that that scene in particular, and 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 the fluff scene and stuff, they're almost like Pinteresque moments. You know, they're almost absurd in in their in in their position in reality. But, yeah, but they work. Yeah, you know that 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 they 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 are. But there's a charge in them, and I yeah. think that's certainly what. Pinter was interested in, and that's that's not too highfalutin for me. That's fine. We can, <laughs> we can t- talk about Pinter, but um, yeah, it's um, you know, there's a, there's a charge that's present, an interpersonal charge that's yeah, yeah, there yeah. in everything for Pinter. He's looking for creating an almost physical tension between characters, and this entire film is built around a kind of physical tension, and even you know, building the film around breath and the idea of breath beginning the film with breath, asking you, the audience, mm. to breathe um, is something to me about ensuring that the film feels physical and feels anchored and that you are having a physical relationship to mm. what's happening there. And it's been interesting to watch the success of the film on Netflix because, you know, when it premiered here in Australia, it premiered on IMAX and um, and I love seeing the film on on that screen and, and for me it really was intended to be a big screen work of cinema. Yeah. But the other side of that is it's also incredibly personal and incredibly psychological and about a, a kind of exterior darkness finding its way into yourself and into your home. And that's obviously translated really well on the, um, on a platform where people are watching it at home. Mm. Yeah. Now, uh, my, my producer, Keith Bell worked with Sean on, uh, Harry Brown. Right. So, Oh yeah. We're used to seeing Sean as a, as a nasty piece well, of work. Sean's such a legendary, Sean's such just a legendary British actor. I mean, I think, you know, he's just one of the finest actors working in English language cinema. And I've just watched him for years. I remember seeing him for the first time in um, in 24 Hour Party People. Yeah, yeah. Playing yeah. Ian Curtis. Unbelievable. And I was like, man, Ian Curtis is fucking terrifying. Mm. Ian Curtis is like, he's so threatening. He gets up in... Um, he gets up in, it must be Steve Coogan's um, face in that film when they first meet. And there's just something, there's a rawness there with Sean mm. that I've always been so, so drawn to. He's such a physical actor. And with this film, I mean, I think he really went, um, he really went somewhere else entirely. Um, his, his partner, actually, when she saw the film, um, said, I can't see anything of you, you know. You're not that. You're not there anymore. You're just completely gone. And I, I can kind of attest to that. We were not dealing with Sean. And when you think about this part, with the amount of, um, you know, scenes that Sean's in, I mean, you know, Joel is very much as Mark is the central character of the film. But I, I think you know, Sean has a lot more dialogue in an Australian accent. Um, mm. He's in more scenes because he's in the whole beginning of the film before Mark um, enters into it. It's really equally both of their films. And I just want to say just quickly on that idea of The Stranger, um, you know, on the title itself, Mm. as I said, we have a central character whose name we never learn, and that title could as much refer to Sean's character as well, the perpetrator of this violence, and that archetypal fear of The Stranger out there waiting to visit violence on us um but it could also refer to the victim it could also refer to the victim's family or to all those nameless people who at the end resolve this um Mm. case because i was really interested in a film that though the reason for the film is violence i didn't want the subject of the film to be violence i wanted the subject of the film to be for better or worse the connections between people Mm. and and really it's actually a film that's held together by empathy because you know i know Every country, um, and Australia's certainly this is certainly true for Australia and for every state and every city. We have these defining. There are these defining moments of violence that have happened, um, usually against you know um, completely innocent individuals um, that really shape the way we think about the safety of the place, mm. and they they shape the way they shape and change the way we think about our connections to one another. Um, and when I was writing this film, there was a number of murders of women who were, um, you know, from their sort of early 20s to mid-30s. Right. 
um, and just out at night or even in the daytime and in public and right in the area where I grew up in the inner north of Melbourne, three or four women were killed within the space of a year and a half by strangers. And um, the effect on the community was just terrible. Um, And um, there was such a feeling, such an outpouring of grief for these people and for their families, but it also immediately, of course, makes you think about the people you care about most. And in building the film around the absence of that victim and also by casting my son as the main character's son, I'm, I'm indirectly, you know, saying to everyone that I worked with and also to the audience, who is this for you? Like, who do you care most about? Mm. What's the what's the inverse of all this darkness? What's the inverse of all this violence? Um, but um, still, you know, it's a very tough film. It was a very tough film to make for, for the four years that it took. Mm. Yeah. I mean, put a scratch in all of our records, and I certainly know it did that for Sean. Yeah. No, no, it's it's it's, uh, it's it's an amazing performance. He, he kind of, I don't know. I mean, do, does is the converse? Does he does he the way that he goes into a role? Is it as much about what he suggests to you as a director from what he's got from the script? Sean had no interest, quite rightly, in the actual case and in the actual individual. Neither of us had any interest in representing the real person responsible. Yeah, um, for the crime. Um, we wanted to create someone who you had never seen before. And it was one of the things that led me to cast Sean coming as he does from England, mm. that you'd never seen him in this context before. He does feel like an outsider. He does feel different. There's something a bit wrong. There's something a little uncanny about mm. the presence of this person. You can't quite place him. Um, I was very conscious of that. But, um, look, we talked for a year Um I would send Sean other material. I would send Sean things that I thought were cultural references of this person, TV shows, songs, music that he would have listened to that would have figured in his life, uh, pieces of documentaries even with individual people who are being spoken to from certain areas of Australia. Um, He worked with a dialect coach for a year. That was very important. Um. And, uh, and really it was a creation between the two of us, sometimes mm. forged out of agreement and sometimes forged out of argument. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, both... Um, Surgeons keep our hearts beating. They do the amazing, help save lives, and so can you. Your CSL Plasma donation can help create 24 critical life-saving medicines that can give Grandpa the chance for his heart to swell when he meets his new grandson or give a bride the chance for her heart to skip a beat on her wedding day. Every plasma donation helps more than you know. Do the amazing. Help save lives. Donate today at your local CSL Plasma Center and be rewarded for your generosity. I think both Sean and I are kind of ready to take it to each other and really um, push each other. And it was um, tough on both of us, but I, but I think it created something unique. You know? mm. there, was, there was a genuine tension in the creation of Henry Teague, as there should be. Mm. Um, but, you know, in the lead up to the film also, um, you know, Sean lost his father to COVID. Oh, wow. Um, and he'd been his, his father had been his sole parent for most of his life. And Sean had been his sole carer for many years um, before his father passed away. And then he had to fly over here, you know, almost immediately after that. And we were in the middle of the pandemic at the time and he was locked in a hotel room for two weeks with the police and the military checking on him daily. Um, And then he had to emerge and play and play Henry Teague. And he threw everything that he had. Um, into that transformation, and um, and it it took took a lot, took a lot out of out of him, I think. But I know he couldn't be more proud of the of the work that's there in the film. The way you portray Mark's paranoia is uh, is obviously because that's that's the workings of what's going on in the mind. So you've got to bring this to the screen, and I think I mean I think it's safe to say that um, that the nightmare sequence, for example. Is one of the best horror sequences I've seen in ages, and we're in the, we're, we're watching a noir film. And you've just suddenly thrown us a, like this complete jo- jo- genre bending moment in the movie that completely yeah drops you drops you drops you deep into his yeah. mind. And, and in fact, there's a few of those moments where we puncture straight through into the 
you know, the depths of Mark's paranoia and his. Um, I mean, the buzzing, the buzzing in the in the in his car his dreams. The the buzzing. Well, the funny thing is, is that you know, like it is a dream. The mm. film is a dream. None of it's none of it's real. Well, you're talking about a a an act of violence that can't be understood. That can never ever be understood we're not willing to interrogate it i'm not interested in what was going on in that person's mind or the mm. reasons behind why he did it and i'm not sure he comprehends those reasons either um and then you know you're, you're dealing with a, a whole fiction where this person is being introduced to a dream life where he can be freed from all these connections to his past and to himself um and and he says multiple times this feels like a dream you know mm. um and uh, and for Mark, he's descending further and further into a nightmare. And I wanted to take us quite literally in, yeah. into his into his head and into those nightmares, and into a version of himself that was being changed by this experience, mm. where he was no longer the person who he was at the beginning of this thing. Um, that he was somehow merging with parts of Henry, or merging with darker parts of himself, or merging with this character he was creating, and you know, and. Um, you know, that was important to me and everything about how the film was framed. And, you know, I designed the poster and I cut the trailer and all of those things were about, you know, that poster of the two of the men's faces together mm. because that poster, if you hold your hand over it, on one side is Sean Harris's face and on the Indeed. other side is Joel's. One side is Henry and the other is is Mark. Um, and that's the literal stranger that you're that you're coming across um, in this thing that the one of my favorite australian well one of my favorite films not just australian films but it happens to be australian is waking fright which obviously oh, yeah. which obviously takes you into this kind of dusty outback thing that from a from a foreigner you kind of think about that's australia and then you yeah get, master masterpiece of a film and directed by a canadian too it's yeah 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 it. madness madness and then you've got uh, you know mystery road um yeah and 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 films like that but but for and again, thinking about what you were saying before about how you were purposely avoiding violence, so you're not you're not doing Snowtown. It's not, but no. but, the, but in in the kind of I'm as sorry. much admiration as much admiration as I have for that film, it's a it's a very it's a very different film. And Justin Kurzel, you know, who made Snowtown and Nitram, I mean, yeah. he has a singular commitment hmm. to going to those darkest, yeah, those darkest places, yeah. But but I still, but I still, but I think with the sort of neo noir broodiness of your of your film. I felt like there was like a filthy film of grease and dirt all over it, you know. It's like that was that's like almost like the identity of the film. It's like you'd put like a gauze over it, like what a watch. So what what was your conversation? What were your conversations like with uh, with Sam Chiplin about about that aesthetic for the film? You know what what were your what were your cinematic references or what were your non cinematic references? That- again, again I, I had Sam for a year. Yeah, uh, Sam and I prepared for this film for a year because we we knew we were going to have to shoot so fast, and we knew we were going to be. Uh, you know, there's an old Gordon Willis uh, quote. Gordon Willis said, "When in doubt, turn off a light." And uh, we we you know we sort of we sort of took that as a mantra. It's not it's about it's not about more. It's about stripping things back and actually getting back to a cinema of darkness. And it's not necessarily noir because it's not necessarily as expressive as noir. But when you look at say you know Conrad Hall's photography in the 50s if you look at a film like in cold blood yeah or if you or if you look at those early gordon willis films um i mean even godfather one and two there's Mm. a profound use of darkness and negative space and look this film needed to have a very strong classical awareness in terms of its photography and all its production design elements because there's so much narrative in the film that i felt like if you had a scrappy handheld you know, um, rough feeling film. Honestly, I think it would be overwhelming. And mm. I think when you're dealing with this subject matter and you're dealing with this level of um, structure in the film, you needed to really direct the eye, really direct the audience's eye, give them very clear images to to hold on to, and really to use negative space to focus their attention, and and sometimes to use. Um, the, the kind of inverse to use white or blank space with the detective side of the story, which has quite a different, quite a different photographic attitude. But I, but I wanted to give it a real sense of classical mystery, and yeah, the films shot on extraordinary lenses that were actually really pioneered. Their use was pioneered by Gordon Willis in the nineteen, I suppose it would be late sixties, early seventies, 
which are the Panavision C series lenses, okay. anamorphic widescreen lenses. Um, they were also used. I mean, you know, there's some of the most storied lenses in in cinema, but the lenses that we use, we use on There Will Be Blood. Mm. Um, and you know, when it comes to those kind of to to that that anamorphic frame, you're obviously talking about uh, space and the creation of space. And with the width of that frame, I also knew that I could hold two characters in the one shot, mm. which gave the film an intensely claustrophobic feeling. And my first film, Acute Misfortune, is actually shot one three three to one, so it's almost a square, and shot on Panavision Primo lenses, which are very romantic Hollywood lenses, um, lenses used on um, films like Mulholland Drive, um, American Beauty, mm. even. Um, so with this, yeah, the, these lenses have a lot of texture. They have a lot of feeling. They're quite idiosyncratic lenses. But I knew that they were going to feel tremendous in those kind of desaturated, really bare exterior landscapes. And again, when it comes to that and the dreamlike quality of the film and the feeling of those landscapes, that's not just there for affectation. We haven't just gone and set the film there because, you know, I mean, I'm aware that we're joining with an Australian film tradition about these kind of places that don't want you and yeah. where you feel unfamiliar and where you're exposed, but also because practically they had to keep that character isolated. They can't have him in populous areas. You can't have him in the city. You can't have him in... Um, you have to keep him in these kind of badlands where there's no potential contact that he can have with people that aren't um, police. Oh, wow. Yeah. But we looked at, you know, tonally we restrict the palette an awful lot, uh, but that extends right through from the locations and the colours of the walls down to wardrobe and, um, you know, the elements are, that are selected. You know, we were trying to create a world that did feel dry and desaturated and tough and not to do that in an artificial way with some... Um, you know, grading trickery at the end yeah. of the process, but that it, was, it felt real and it felt physical. And, um, you know, again, talking about breath and the way breath works in the film being such a central theme, it's something that people have tried to avoid a lot with those anamorphic widescreen lenses, which is as you roll focus through them, they breathe. We talk about them breathing. They have a vertical okay. movement okay. that happens with those lenses. Um, and that's something that we tried to use along all with all those elements that were that were sort of um yeah restating that theme over through the film no no I mean, it's 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 re it, it's really arresting there's there's like the strange one of the colors that springs to mind which isn't a color i'd associate with with, with as i understand australian cinema is like olive green like that, that's which is yeah. not a, which is not a standout color at all it's uh it, but but that that permeates some some of the a lot of the interiors and stuff from you know from the eye. That's... Yeah, yeah, and I think obviously you have a lot of that with the sort of pine forests. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Toward so, yeah. the end, that are that are on the other side of the of the other side of the country. Yeah. Um, the 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 other the, the other side of it, is if if that's the aesthetic and and how you got there, then an important part, and certainly I think this is an important part of of how you achieve that idea of the dream as the film is the use of music um, and the type mm. of music because. Obviously, there's traditional sort of score music in there, but there's this that you use sh like short bursts of arresting visceral sound as well as, you know, it reminded me a bit of like you know the way um, Johan Johansson's score works on um, Sicario yeah. with Dino Villeneuve, where yeah. where you're pounding us with the music. You're not you're not making you're not inviting yeah. us to to sort of go along with the melody. You're going, this is an emotion. I want you to hit you in the face. Man, I, I still, I, I actually still find it hard to talk about Johan Johansson because I just think his loss is mm. so profound. I, I think his, his influence on um, film music is just, you, you, you can't overstate it. Mm. And, um, you know, in, in scores like, like Arrival or Sicario, certainly, you know, there's very, there's a very physical, weighted feeling i don't know how to talk about that that acoustic work than he did but there's a gravity there's yeah. a gravity and i said, I said to my wife when we first watched shikaro you know he's managed to make mm. the sound of the industrial military complex and i don't know how to describe yeah, it any better right. than that yeah that's right and for me it was about an eternal physical sound that was there 
that takes human violence quite seriously as its subject in this film and says we are dealing with something which um, tragically is is absolutely eternal mm. um, about human nature here. Um, and the moral position of the film is that, yes, you can resolve this case, but you can't resolve all human violence. And we use sound to take you into a lot of places, but one of the things that music does is to take you deep into a physical experience. Again, it was all about trying to make things physical. Mm. And, you know, Oliver Coates, who's a British cellist, supplied the score, who's, you know, been a part of some of the great scores for the last 15 years. He he played all the instrumentation on um, Michael Levy's score to Under the Skin, um, and he's worked an awful lot with Johnny Greenwood, and it's almost all cello, that sound, whether it's filtered or distorted, but it's a physical uh, that deep physical bowed sound. And I also worked with an experimental percussionist called Matthias Shackarnett, mm. who created that kind of um, fluttering visceral sound that's been variously described as like an indigenous bull roarer, which is an, a, an instrument that was like a declaration of war or like a moth fluttering against glass or something trapped yeah. or a heartbeat or... Um, you know, or again, it was all about attaching it to that central idea of the. the again, we we keep returning to the dream and the physical, so this kind of psychological dimension, and then this very physical, concrete um, dimension. Just to return really quickly, just because it does refer back to sound and music and everything, but yeah. when it came to the photography, you know, the most terrifying thing in this film is to be still, to come to a place of stillness, to come to a place of silence. And there's only a few moments that this film ever stops and it's the worst thing imaginable for our central character is to have to stop. That scene at Henry's house where mm. Henry ends up dancing, the confession itself, the moment before the arrest. But otherwise, we are always in a physical relationship to them moving. We're always travelling or the camera's bolted to cars and the sound is trapped within those contexts. It's made highly um, subjective, it's pressurized. And, you know, then there are these occasional moments of kind of cognitive dissonance where you go to the sound of the recording device and you're made aware that we're actually, this entire thing is being recorded mm. through these bugs or hidden cameras and you're hearing, are you are you hearing some frequency that these things are giving off? But But, you know, in actuality, that was more like, a psychological gesture that was like an anxiety attack, mm. like simultaneously being in a situation while your consciousness is moving further and further away and detaching from your experience and you're just trying to um, um, trying to hold it together. Mm. Um, now, this is, yeah. I mean, this isn't a thought I had watching it, but just with the way you're talking about it, and I know aesthetically it looks very differently, but I'm, I'm reminded of like, when I first watched Under the Skin, when I think about your film now, the way you're describing yeah. it, you know, there's like, you complete, in the sense of the way that you discombobulate the audience with the way you're choosing to tell the story. Yeah, and that you come into it with little information and yeah. you have to unpack it more and more and more and you're made to work and intuit and think deeply about, like, what might be happening here? Like, we mm. never learn the agenda of that central character, really. Mm beyond to kind of like liquefy these individuals, you know, after laying this kind of alien honey trap. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's, no, look, it's a phenomenal film. And, um, you know, I find his work really um, inspiring. I mean, I love British cinema, but I think um, Jonathan Glazer, um, what I love about Jonathan Glazer, and I suppose the thing that's most important to me is that for me, film is all about the relationship between form and content. It's like, what's the material that you've got? And then what form does it demand? And that should be completely idiosyncratic to that material that you are dealing with. You are trying to be led by that and have them reflect one another. And it's interesting because, you know, people use this word content to talk about narrative all the time, which I really think is fucking awful. Yeah, it's um, reductive, isn't it? It's so reductive. But on a practical level, content is horizontal. Content is like this happens and this happens and this happens and because of that, this happens and this person maybe feels that way but then this happens and it travels along a horizontal line. Mm. Um, but form is vertical and form is about those eternal elements and 
the the in whatever way you can think about it, and I think about it this way: the the three dimensionality of the story, the multi dimensionality of it. How can you cre- try to create in a film something that is physical, that's that's real, that's tangible, mm. um, and it's and it's it's you know it's built of ideas and it's built of all these. Just as interestingly, I went into this. I went to this talk recently by an Australian novelist who made a really interesting film many years ago, and it's a, it's a it's a um, a strong film. Uh, but he said he only made this one film, and he said after he after he directed this film, he realised that novels are cosmoses, where films are kind of short stories with bits tacked on them. <laughs> And um, <laughs> I thought that's pretty um, disparaging. And more more than that, I think you're wrong um, because, sure, novels are cosmoses. They're cosmoses of words and they mm. require no economy because you're untethered from any realities that you have to deal with, practical, logistical things of filmmaking. But the film is a cosmos. It's a cosmos of all its elements, of the sound, the movement, mm. the rhythm, the interrelationship of people the colour, the textures, the feeling, like you talk about the visual feeling of the lenses, those visual choices. And as a filmmaker, you're trying to take all these elements which on their own are like smoke and each their own individual artistic discipline and and shepherd them toward the one concrete um, form. And um, if, if that weren't grounded in the material, it would be just aesthetics and that would be as meaningless as as pure content it would be pure form so it's got to be the tension between those two things what what is this story what's the what binds this story together and and then what what is the unique voice of this film what's the unique form well this, that's a good segue for me last my last sort of question question really is about edit is where the form really really comes into its own you know you've got all the pieces that you've brought to it you know you you've got what you chose to shoot the people you've cast the sounds and music you've created around it so what was what did you discover about the stranger in the edit that wasn't that was that was that wasn't evident going into it? It's interesting because for people who are very interested in film but haven't made film, there is no way to explain what the edit is or or really how it works. Yeah, um, and or to make it clear that it's actually the defining part of filmmaking, mm. um, because you know. You, you you write to shoot and you shoot to cut, but then the language that you find in the edit, it, it needs to be responsive to the material. And if you're really doing your work properly, at some point in time you have to be led by the film and you have to let go of um, a kind of illusion of control and seize the control that you have in that, in that edit. Um, we try to be responsive to everything, to find new associations, and new connections, um, to shift things if we need to, to tighten things. Obviously, you're losing things just on a practical level. All films end up, you know, hemorrhaging scenes. Um, but you're, tr- you, you, you're, you're trying to create something uh, concrete. And it's like, you know, when a film works, I think they get to the point where they feel fated, where they feel like everything has aligned and travelled into this place. But really in the background, what audiences don't see, that it's like trying to solve a Rubik's Cube that's as big as a house and it's in an irregular shape and everything that you move affects something somewhere else. And there is no organised paradigm about how you can approach an edit. It is just relentless um, problem solving Mm. from the largest problems down to the smallest until you're dealing with those infinitesimal um, one frame changes that by the end can, can, can mean everything. But every frame on this film is just touched dozens and dozens and dozens of times. It was really important to us who made this film, the filmmakers, myself and all the heads of department, that, that we made a film that was really of the highest international standard. Mm. We didn't want to make a strong Australian film. We didn't want to make a... We, we, we know the lineage that we're a part of. We're very proud to be a part of that, that lineage of sort of Australian crime cinema. 
they're some of my favorite films. They've really shaped me and they've shaped this country. You know, you talked about Wake and Fright, um, you know, um, or films like Chopper, Justin Kurzel's films, Rowan Woods' film The Boys, um, Animal Kingdom. I mean, there are just there are just so many. Um, but I'm as influenced by them as I am by a much more art house history of Australian film. You're, you're thinking about all these things all the time, but really on a on a craft level, we we wanted the film to be able to to, to be able to work at an international standard. And that was the that was what we tried to hold ourselves to, and it was like getting pulled apart by horses on the <laughs> on the on the budget that we had and the time that we had. It was um, yeah, it was really tough. It took a long time to to recover from. I could I couldn't be more proud of the edit. Couldn't be more proud of my work with um, Simon, who um, he also cut the Babadook actually. Oh, did he? Okay. Um, this is only, I think, it's uh, it's one of the very few narrative features that Simon has cut. His first feature film was Babadook. He also cut um, Jennifer Kent's second film, Nightingale. Nightingale. Um, yeah, but um, but I know it, it 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 means a lot to him because it was a a very fluid, very complex edit, and I'm really someone who believes the film should be remade in the edit. Yeah. No, no, it's it's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant. Work of art, your movie. I really, I, I can't, I, I won't try and tell you, try and put into words how much I enjoyed it. I just, it was just a brilliant film, and I'm really glad to have had the chance to talk to you about it. Um, one last thing, I, I, I put it at the top, and I've forgotten one because we got straight into the film. But obviously, this, this, the stranger played at Cannes on certain regards. So, what's a memory from uh, an uncertain regard world premiere that you that you'll hold it, on to for a long time? Uh, um... Can you know we were the first Australian film in eight years to play in that section, mm. um, and uh, it was you know I got to speak to Justin about his experience, but no one can really prepare you um, for that. And you know the film received a seven minute long standing ovation at the end, and uh, I couldn't get out of there soon enough. <laughs> it was awful. I was just like, it's really a uh, you know as a filmmaker, un- unless you really are. I don't know. It's it's certainly not the way I think about art, but you, you're trying to put all your attention, everything you have out there in that film. Every fibre of your being is is in that film, on that screen. The last thing you're doing is thinking about yourself. You're trying to get the best out of all of your collaborators, everyone that you're working with, down to the last person, down to the worker that, I mean, the dialogue editors, everybody, I mean, you know, those guys made such an impact on the film. You're down there in the weeds till they peel your fingers off it and say, right, that's it. You're not allowed to touch it anymore. That's it. It's done. Mm. And you have to walk away from the film. And, uh, you know, someone said to me after my first film, you know, films aren't um, finished. They're, films are never finished. They're just abandoned. <laughs> and I responded that, no, they're taken away by the Department of Child Protection. <laughs> like, <laughs> They, they they are taken they are ripped out of your hands and uh, there's a kind of there's a kind of trauma to that you know like this this thing is is gone and um, and then to have all that attention turn on myself and on the other key creatives on this film I think we all just to be honest just wanted to get the fuck out of there <laughs> like it's an honor and you love it and they're insisting that you take ownership for this film that that you've um, made. Um, but, um, interestingly, after that premiere, I heard a story about Justin Curzel trying to walk out of the standing ovation for Nitram. So I don't know if it's just something about the Australian character or, um, or something about Justin and I more particularly, but, um, yeah, no, look, it, it was a great experience and I got to spend some time with Ethan Cohen and for that I'm eternally grateful. Well, look, uh, The Strangers on Netflix uh, for anyone that wants to see it, that's not, that's listen to this conversation. And it just gives me to say thank you very much for giving your time on the Britflix podcast. Thanks so much, Stuart.
Become a part of the Horton team. We're looking for welders, painters, assemblers, machine operators, cabinet makers, and other positions to build emergency vehicles that help save lives. Join us at our hiring event on Wednesday, January 18th from 2 to 5 p.m. at 3800 McDowell Road in Grove City. We offer a huge $1,500 sign-on bonus and great benefits such as 401k match, medical coverage starting day one, and much more. For more information on what Horton can do for you, visit careers.revgroup.com and search Grove City.